We had a couple gentlemen that could not be with us today. Uh, Ed Havelich, who's pretty much always been here, and Perry Little both had some COVID concerns about coming, and so they just thought it was best that they stayed away. But stepping in for them, um, talking about why the triune God, we're going to be having, in a few minutes, Kevin Luna is going to come up, and then Jim Shirka. We'll bring them up in a little bit. But subbing in for Ed and Perry is our host, Pastor Daniel Whalen, talking about the Father is God and the Son is God. Pastor? Thank you so much. Welcome to the B Team. Uh, it's good to be able to be here, and I am sorry that you guys don't get to hear from those great guys and that you got to listen to me, uh, but we can make it through this, and I think it'll be good. So go ahead and take out your Bibles and be ready to jump around just a little bit. Uh, we are going to have the words on the screen behind me and on the screen back there for my sake, um, but I think this is what we have to do. Because of the very nature of what we're looking at, this is not something where we can just jump at one spot and call it good. We really are going to have to take a survey approach. Now, it's not been all that long ago, but uh, my daughter, who is seven now, that's a couple years ago, she asked me the very tough question. She asked, she said, Dad, what's the Trinity? And I thought, okay, good. You know, I'm glad that you're catching on to some of this and, and what we're talking about. And I said, well, here's what we believe whenever we believe in, in the Trinity, in a triune God. We believe in the three distinct persons of the Godhead. And that's all big language. And she's just doing this number looking at me. I said, here's what we believe. We believe that there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. And so we know that for very much a fact. And we know that they are all God and we know that God is one and for a child she heard that she kind of curled up her nose and then uncurled it and goes oh okay you know and so for her uh, it's just something where we said this is how it is we worship father son and holy spirit three distinct persons one God and those facts they don't always uh, exist in our heads in a nice and easy way uh, but this is what the Bible teaches now I hold that conversation in contrast with the conversation that I had uh, with a man not too long ago who called me up on the phone and and wanted to talk and whenever he talked with me, he accused me of being a tritheist. In other words, he was accusing me of being somebody who worships and believes in three gods. But we don't believe that, church. We hold to one God. So out of our endeavor this afternoon with this uh, kind of a survey approach, uh, me taking the Father and the Son, Kevin Luna taking the Holy Spirit, and, and who's, after, who's after Kevin? There you are. Uh, we got uh, Jim, and uh, that's right, right? Okay, Jim. I'm worried I'm going to forget something here. Jim is going to tie it all together, going to put a big old nice bow on everything. But what I'm going to do today is I am going to endeavor to prove to you that the Father and the Son are God and that they are distinct in person. Uh, but I'm going to leave it up to Jim to, uh, to show you that they are one. Okay, uh, so uh, let's go ahead and start this off. We're going to start by looking at the Father. And so uh, the first of two sections, the Father is God. And as I was preparing for this, I had to stop and think, what are the, the necessary things in my mind uh, that I think are the, the things that make uh, the qualities or the characteristics of God? Um, and actually, whenever I looked at some different theologians, there's a, there's a basic set. You've got uh, a basic three, and then you you can go and look at other people and they've got a whole lot of other characteristics that are necessary of of God but for me as I was studying and looking I kind of thought there are there are four great big ones that for me have always been things that have grabbed a hold of my attention so I do not believe that you can have less than these but I do believe that you can have more characteristics that are pretty important to describe who God is and so I have five uh, or four necessary attributes of deity the fifth one is in the fact that it's, uh, it's split on uh, my fourth point there. But uh, number one is the issue of power. 
Whenever it comes to the issue of power, I recognize right away um, I'm, I'm not a very strong guy. Matter of fact, I, I'm quite limited in what I can do. My strength is very limited. And whenever I was in high school, we had a weightlifting class, and I thought, I'm going to take it. I'm going to get ripped. I'm going to be so strong. And, and my, my, uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, who I ended up marrying, she's going to think I'm so good looking. That was my thought. And I, I went in to go do the bench press, and, and I could do it. And I thought, that was really good. And then the guy came up behind me, and he's like, that ain't enough. And he slapped another set of 45s on the side of it and did a set of 10. And I'm thinking, I just barely did one on what it previously was. And I, I began to realize real quick, I'm not that strong. I'm just absolutely not that strong. I don't have that much strength in my legs. I don't have that much strength in my arms. Uh, but at the same time, I know that there is a God who is incredibly powerful. Now, whenever we talk about the power of God, maybe you've heard it in this term, omnipotence, okay? Um, All-powerful is what we mean by that. And this is a necessary characteristic or uh, attribute of God. And the reason why I believe that is because if there is something more powerful than God, can you say that that was God? I don't really feel like you can. If there's a bigger domino that can knock over the last one, uh, then we need to go further back. If, if there was something that created our God, then our God is not God, and I want to be able to find our God. And so I believe that it is necessary for God to prove that he is powerful, and he proves that to us in his word. Actually, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that all Scripture is breathed out by God, and what we have is everything that we need for every good work. So we can be prepared to understand who our God is, even though it may be a little bit difficult for us to wrap our minds around. So whenever it comes to talking about the power of God, there's an awful lot that is said about the power of God. But I tried to limit my sources to those who actually referred to uh, God the Father. And so uh, I've got a couple of those. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. That's a pretty powerful way to describe things. If you ever wanted to take some clay and throw it on a wheel and, and form up a bowl or a pot, you could do that. And in that same sense, if you didn't like it anymore, you could smash it all back down and reduce it back to a lump and begin to reform it. That is at the pleasure of the artist who's doing the work. And, and here in Isaiah, we have God being described as the potter, the person who is working the clay and making it into what he desires for it to look like that is our God Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 6 says do you thus repay the Lord you foolish and senseless people is not he your father who created you who made you and established you once again those are some pretty big words, and it's a strong reminder uh, for the people as they are dealing with God that it is God who is powerful, and in comparison, uh, there's just no comparison. Uh, there is no way for us to be able to stand up and measure ourselves in comparison uh, to God the Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6, jumping into the New Testament says, yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. This is a, another great passage speaking of the power of the Father. Now, I heard a, I heard a, a joke one time, and it went something like this. It said that there was a, a competition between a bunch of scientists and God, and, and the scientists had said to God that uh, you are nothing. We can do everything you can do. We can, we can create everything inside the lab. We can have all kinds of fun. We can, we can do things that are incredible. You are nothing. And so God said, okay, let's have a build-off. They said, all right, you're going to have to make something new and incredible, make life. And uh, the, the scientists said, sure, we can do that. And then they got ready to go and they reached down to grab the stuff inside the lab. And God said, whoa, 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 use your own stuff, right? <laughs> Whenever it came to God, how did God create? He created out of nothing, ex nihilo. He created out of nothing, spoke everything into existence. That's pretty awesome. That's a pretty awesome thing that our God should be able to create in such a powerful and mighty way. You know, um, I'm going to be beginning a, uh, a renovation project in my basement. I wish 
because I did a renovation project in my basement last time. It, it took me two years uh, to be able to get it done from the point to where it was not livable to the point where it is livable. Two years, that's how long it took me. And so I'm looking at this wall that we have to build, and it's just a wall with a door. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can get that done in a year. That's how long that'll take me according to my track record. I so wish I was God. Wall, right? But that's not how it works. So I'm hiring it out and having somebody else do it, okay? Uh, I'm not powerful. My God is a powerful God. And so I believe that power is a necessary attribute for somebody to be able to claim the position of deity and not just having a lot of power, right? We could have a wrestling match in this room and we could go ahead and figure it out. Who's the strongest guy in here? Who's the most, you know, uh, uh, able to move and able to put people in headlocks, that kind of thing. We could have a wrestling match like that. Um, we might be able to figure out who it is, but nobody would be able to compare with the power of our God. So number one, you've got power. Number two is the issue of knowledge. Um, I, I like learning, and I will also be the first one to admit I don't know everything. Don, I don't know everything. Um, I am as absolutely flawed as it can be whenever it comes to being able to know things. I got to study and then and then I think I got it figured out and I realized I forgot some of it. And I got to go back and study again. And and then even way down the road, I, I realize I, I've totally forgotten. You guys ever do this deal where you look at your kids and you know it's the youngest. So you should know that their name is Joshua. But instead, you cycle through all the kids before you get to that child. Anybody else do that? Yeah, we got a flaw in our memory there. If you don't, I'm really proud of you. You're a really good parent. Um, but man, I tell you what, it's something how, it's amazing how easily we can forget even important things. And, and our minds just do things that we're not prepared for. But whenever it comes to my God, my God needs to be omniscient. He needs to have and possess all knowledge. Now, I've heard some theologians try and quantify what that would look like to possess all knowledge. And so we run through the Bible, right? We, we look at all the things that the Bible tells us that God knows. He, he knows the number of days that you're going to live. The Bible tells us he knows that even before we've lived them while we're yet in our mother's womb, right? Those days are written for him. Uh, he knows the number of hairs on your head. You know, that's a big number for some and a small number for others. Uh, he knows all the different things that are going on inside our head. You're thinking, do I have to laugh at this guy's jokes? Uh, God God knows that you're thinking that inside your head, okay? Um, but God knows all these things. Uh, theologians have also kind of thought about what are some of the other things he would know. Uh, he would know the position of every single atom in the universe, and that's crazy to think about. I, I had somebody who, who told me what that was supposed to look like, and I'm telling you, I can't remember the number exactly. Uh, but like, if we start adding zeros, if you got three zeros, you're in the hundreds, and then you get into the hundreds of thousands, and then you get into the millions, and then you get into billions, and and trillions and quadrillions and quintillions and then I forget the words after that but basically you'd have to add on like another 50 or 80 zeros I forget what it was it was a huge number uh, for the number of estimated atoms inside the universe and it's just just an incredible thing to be able to think about and yet my God knows them all you know the Bible tells us that whenever God put the the stars into the sky. He, he knows where each and every single one of them are. He's not forgotten. He's not misplaced. He doesn't forget their names. He knows each one of them. That's a pretty incredible thought. Uh, I love how uh, Rob described being able to look up at the night sky yesterday. That was, that was awesome. Having an uninhibited view and thinking it looked cloudy and being told that's the Milky Way stretched out across the night sky. God knows even the individual stars that comprise the dust of that soupy mess. God knows it all. That's a pretty awesome thing to think about. And so my God would need to know all those things. Because if there was something he didn't know, that means there's a possibility of something that could know all of it or know more. And then in which case God would not be God. And so whenever it comes to the father, the Bible tells us in a couple of places, gives us a, a hint of this all knowing state of our heavenly father. Matthew chapter six, verse eight says, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, that might not sound all that incredible. But I know I've also found myself walking into the kitchen looking for something to eat, opening the fridge door and not sure what I'm going to take out of it. 
I know what it's like to be limited in that regard. My God does not find himself limited in that way. Acts chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. He knows all of the things that are going to happen. You know, whenever we turn on the news, one of the things that we like to see on the news, we like to see what happened today and yesterday. So what's already happened. And then they get to a special section they call the weather section, where a guy gets up and stands in front of a map and tells you what it's supposed to do tomorrow. It's a really incredible endeavor. They do pretty good for a couple of days out, and then it really starts to get iffy right after that. But my God knows whether or not it's going to rain in 10 years on Tuesday. I mean, that's the kind of thing that my God knows, and he's not limited in that way. Now, as far as the rest of, uh, rest of looking at Scripture, specifically looking for uh, verses or passages that, that use uh, the term Father whenever referring to God, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit limited whenever it comes to this issue of knowledge, but at the same time, when we look at the Old Testament, we can see that there are a lot of passages where it is referring to the Father in general, um, and it speaks of his knowledge. Um, and I got a big old list. I'm not going to make you read them. Genesis 18, 20 through 21, 1 Samuel 23, 9 through 12, Job 34, 21 through 23, Psalm 15, verse 3, chapter 19, verse 12, chapter 33, verses 13 through 15, chapter 51, verse 6, 56, verse 8, 139, uh, verse Verses 1 through 6. Okay, you guys get what I'm saying here. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3. Isaiah 29, 15. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 10. Malachi 316. Uh, so there's an awful lot that can be seen that points to the fact that God knows all things. The third attribute that I believe God must possess is that of goodness. Sometimes you might see it referred to as om omnibenevolence, okay? Uh, but you probably won't hear that spoke because nobody uses a word like that in speech, okay? Uh, they say that God is good. Matter of fact, we've already sang a song, and it, maybe it sings it a few too many times, but we sing, God is good, right? Uh, you're a good, good father. That's what we sing. That's who you are. That's who you are, right? Uh, and we sing that over and over because we are affirming the fact that our God is a good God. Now, uh, Psalm chapter 103, verse 13, uh, references the Father in the relationship to what's being said. But he says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Whenever it comes to raising kids... It's expensive. And so I told Alethe and Karis and uh, Ezra that uh, those are my older three, uh, the ones that you can really talk to. Uh, I told them, I said, guys, this is getting expensive. You ate a whole box of cereal last week and uh, mom had to make dinner for you every single night of the week. We've continued to house you and you're still not paying rent. Karis, my middle, looked up at me and she just like, giving me that, that attitude look, like I'm thinking I'm going to have trouble later on. And uh, she goes, Dad, we don't have jobs. <laughs> well, I don't. But you know what? I'm so glad to be able to raise them. I'm so glad to be able to have them there, to be able to love on them, to be able to experience life with them, to be able to talk with them and have these weird conversations where a child's mind goes places that as adults we've learned not to go. They just automatically explore the world in a different way. And I thought, you know, I'm awfully glad that mom and dad didn't make me have to have a job, right? Just to be able to be raised in mom and dad's house. They loved me and they showed goodness to me in an awful great way. And this passage in Psalm 103 tells us that as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. We do worship a good God. Our God is a good and amazing God. First John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. There in First John chapter 3, verse 1 it's talking about that great love that the Father has shown, allowing us to be called children, to be called His children. 
What an incredible thought that we are adopted in, uh, grafted into the vine, brought in as a part of the family of God in a position that we have no right to be able to claim. But our God has loved us in that great way. John chapter 14 and verse 26 is another passage where we can see the goodness of the Father. You might read this and think that's about the Holy Spirit, but I want you to pay attention to what it says about the Father. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. I share this passage with our church pretty often here at Sunrise Baptist, and I remind them of the fact that the Holy Spirit does this incredible work in our life, reminding us of what we have read previously in the Word of God, reminding us of how it applies to our life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to sit there and convict us concerning sin and righteousness. That's an awesome thing that should happen. But the reason the Holy Spirit comes is because it says the Father has sent Him. Praise the Lord that our good Father would send the Holy Spirit to walk with us through this life. So we see this goodness. Matthew 6, 26 is another one where we see the goodness of God. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You most certainly are. And in the same sense that God takes care of them, God provides for us as well. And so the Father is God, these, these necessary attributes, power, knowledge, goodness, and then lastly, this issue of eternality, for me, is a really important one. Because in my mind, this is how I think. I like to think about what caused what just happened, right? Uh, you had a car wreck. What led to the car wreck? You had training. What led to that training? What was the result of that training? We like to think in terms of cause and effect. If I press this button, it's going to stop the gas pump from dispensing the gas. Raising kids again, right? Uh, I, I, I took my daughter, my oldest daughter, and we were out, and we had to put gas in the car. And I said, just go ahead and get out of the car with me. We can, we can talk while I'm filling up, the, filling up the car with gas. And so I take out the pump, stick it in the car, pull the thing, the lock it in place, and I start talking with Alethea. And she turns around, and she's looking at the pump, and, and she just kind of like gets a little curious, and then all of a sudden reaches up and sticks her hand into that area where the pump normally sits, and it pushes the switch, and the pump goes off. Right. And I had a bill for two dollars and thirty cents as a partial fill up on a full tank of gas. I had to bill started all over again. She looked at it and thought, well, there's a button. I wonder what happens if I press it. She found out the results. That's how we like to think and how we see things. Uh, but whenever it comes to God, I want you to understand. I like the idea of our God being a God that we could look backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards and backwards and never, never discover the beginning of. And the reason is simple, because if there was a beginning, eventually we're going to have to ask the question, well, what, what caused the beginning? What, what caused our God to begin? And maybe it wouldn't even be a question that we could answer, but if there was a beginning, that means then there was a time whenever our God was not. That's a problem. And so then our God, whenever we talk about eternality, it breaks down into two different ways because you can look into two different directions and you can have an eternity in two different directions. I realize that still makes an eternity as a whole, but in my mind, this is just how I think. So go with me, OK? You can look into eternity past. In other words, we need to know that our God, as God the Father, he is uncreated. This is what it says, talking of God in Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even for from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Church, real quick, when, when did God begin according to that passage? He didn't. He's always existed. Another one's Isaiah chapter 63, verse 16. It says, For you are our Father. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer of old is your name. You know what you do whenever you can't be able to put your finger all the way on the beginning point? You just go a long time ago, right? Back to raising kids. My children, although the oldest is only seven, and while the youngest that talks is only five or four, and they're not very old, they'll often say, oh, long, long time ago, we watched this TV show, Dad. I was like, when was that? 
It's like last week is what they're talking about. Okay? For them, that seems like a long time. But for us who've got a little bit of perspective, what's a long time? A long, long time ago. Longer than the life that we've lived. Longer than a point that we can put a point on it and say, that right there is the beginning for this passage in Isaiah 63. It's not putting a point exactly in any one place. It's saying from before everything else. So there's an eternality in the sense that God the Father is uncreated, and then also in the sense that He will continue to exist. He has a continued existence. John chapter 17, verse 1 says, When Jesus had spoken these words, He lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, that the Son may glorify You. Who is Jesus praying to? He's praying to the Father. Uh, he's speaking to the Father. The Father did not cease to exist simply because the Son came on the scene. The Father continues to be there. And whenever Jesus instructed His disciples in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 about how they should pray, He said, pray then like this, our Father in heaven hallowed be your name is that a prayer that we should still pray today absolutely and why because the father still exists and the father will be there all the way until we get to what looks like the end and then eternity past then now there might be more but there can't be less whenever it comes to these attributes of our God. Uh, some theologians, they've made a huge list, the, the attributes of God's love and God's jealousy and other things like that. Um, and they're all a part of who our God is. And the Father is God. Now, the objections to the Father being God, they, they only break down in a couple of ways. Number one, you've got an atheistic argument or the objection to the supernatural. That's just simply denying that God exists. Um, this is not an argument that would be any kind of conclusion to the person who holds this view. But for our perspective of things, Psalm 14, verse 1 is pretty instructive. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. We know that there is a God. So that argument, it's going to fall. It's just not going to be an argument where we can reason with that individual other than to show them the work and the power of God, point them to what God has done. There is the modalistic argument trying to deal with the issue of God. God used to be that way, but now he's changed. Um, I don't believe this at all. You know, we look, in, we look in John chapter 17, and we can see that Jesus is praying in the high priestly prayer. He's praying to the Father, the Father is receiving that prayer. It's pretty awesome uh, to be able to read through that there in John chapter 17. Uh, you've got the baptism of Jesus as well, where the Father speaks as Jesus being raised up out of the water, uh, proclaiming that this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. You know, uh, it's a pretty awesome moment right there. Um, and so this, this idea that God is uh, changing God or he's changed in some other ways uh, to try and eliminate this understanding of God the Father uh, is uh, one that doesn't hold a whole lot of water. The last argument that I have encountered inside the church. This is not a reasoned argument, nor should anybody believe it is. Uh, it's the argument, well, I don't like that attribute, or I don't like that characteristic of God. I don't like the idea of God the Father because he seems jealous or mean or something like that. Uh, this, is, this is not a good argument. This is an argument that, uh, that goes nowhere, because in the same sense, I can tell you that I don't like paying taxes. Anybody love paying taxes? I will go ahead and take a raise of hands there. Okay. I was going to say, if you did, you could pay mine. Uh, but I don't like paying taxes, but just because I don't like it doesn't mean I can get away with saying, well, I don't believe the IRS exists, right? Of course not. I can't do that. It's going to continue to exist even if I don't like it. So the Father is God. And I believe that we can look at Scripture and see that the Scripture tells us that the Father is God. Let's move on to the second portion. The Son is God. Once again, I'm just going to go ahead and cover these five same necessary attributes in my mind, because if they work for the Father, they will work for the Son as well. So going back up to that issue of power, once again, for the Son of God. I love the book of John. Matter of fact, if I have somebody that's new to the faith, um, or just, you know, like they're kind of exploring what Christianity is all about, I often suggest that they go and read the book of John. John was written with the purpose of, of 
convincing people to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And so John was very specific in choosing the miracles that are represented there. And so for us, it's very useful, okay? Uh, whenever it comes to looking at the power of Jesus as God, the Son of God, uh, we can see that he has power because in John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, we see him change water into wine. And while that might be a, a difficult thing for us to understand as Southern Baptists, maybe the rest of you don't have that problem, uh, but for us, we can look and see God is doing something rather incredible, okay? It's incredible to be able to see that. Or in John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54, we see him healing the royal official's son in Capernaum. This, once again, is a pretty incredible thing. We've got medicine. We can do great things, you know? Uh, my, my youngest son, is, is, is he's got some real problems uh, medical-wise, and we've got some really incredible equipment at our house that keeps track of who he is, and some really sophisticated and smart doctors that can test and understand what's going on inside his body, but you know what they have yet to do? Fix my son. Jesus can. He can heal. He can heal in ways that we could only ever hope to be able to experience. Not only that, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15, we see him heal the paralytic at Bethesda. Uh, we see him give the ability to walk once again to somebody who did not have that ability before. He, he restored a, a way of life for that individual. In John chapter 6, verses 5 through 14, we see him feed the 5,000 people. And this is one of the miracles that the Baptists can get behind, okay? Uh, we get pretty excited about the possibility of some food. Jesus. Jesus Christ took a little bit of food and he turned it into enough to feed 5,000 men and all the other people that would have been around him. That's incredible. You know, whenever we stop and try and plan for something like this, there's, there's a bunch of us here in this room, and, and that's great and wonderful, but whenever we're planning and trying to schedule and figure out what we're going to do, and we're told by Charles that we're going to feed you twice for lunch, and we're going, well, I don't know what we're going to do, right? There's meetings that are had where we try and figure out, well, what do you think? How many people? What's it going to cost? What's the best thing that we can do? What can we do? And there's all these meetings and planning, and my wife did a whole lot of work getting everything together, and ultimately, finally, we get it there. There's a bill to be paid, and there's still things to be cleaned up and all this other stuff. Jesus Christ just showed up, took advantage of what was there, and fed everybody. That's incredible. That's incredible to be able to see that. We see in John chapter 6, verse 16 through 24, Jesus walking on the water. There ain't a single one of us that can do that. A couple years back, there was a video on the internet that went viral and had all these guys talking about these special shoes with the special coating that made them hydrophobic so they were able to run a little ways on the water. And it turned out that when they did a little bit of examining, they could see that they had installed some tables just underneath the level of the water. So that way they could run a ways out into the water and then finally fall off whenever they ran out of table to walk on. It was really funny. Jesus Christ comes walking across the water in the middle of the storm, walking all the way out to the boat. That's incredible. The things that would normally be too scary for us to even get into the water because of the bad storm and the waves and everything else that's going on, we would not want to be there. Here comes Jesus just walking through it all. Our God has power. Jesus Christ has power. We see in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, him healing the blind man from birth. For me, this has been a passage that's been really important where you've got a man who has been blind since birth all that time. And yet Jesus Christ walks right up to him and heals him. Gives him the ability to see. I want you to imagine experiencing the world and only knowing the world as darkness. And then all of a sudden, after having an encounter with Jesus Christ, a world of light floods into your mind. Jesus Christ made that possible. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 45, we see Jesus do the incredible. If people were talking about all that he had done previously, they were talking after this. Jesus Christ raised Lazarus from the dead. Stood in front of the tomb and said, come forward. Come out of there. It's incredible what Jesus Christ is able to do. 
You know, this is not even speaking of the fact that Jesus Christ didn't just stop there. Jesus Christ also went to the cross for our sins, where the Bible tells us that he died on the cross and that three days later he rose from the dead. That's an incredible thing that our God should do. So whenever it comes to being able to determine whether or not the Son of God possesses power, I'm going to argue from Scripture that Scripture shows us that Jesus Christ most certainly has power. What about knowledge? Jesus possesses knowledge as well. John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Church, I have found myself in situations before where I have had conversations and friendships with individuals that I thought were just absolutely incredible people only to have that illusion pulled away whenever the issue of sin was discovered in their life and the reality of who they were was suddenly exposed for a short moment. It's very upsetting. And I have even found myself questioning, well, how can I even know anybody? How can you know anybody? How can you know the person that you're sitting next to? How can how can you really know all that's going on there? The people that we meet inside the church, we're so bad about doing this. We see one another. We say, hey, how are you doing? And and you say, fine. And I say, me, too. And we walk away. Meanwhile, we're hurting. We're struggling. We're caught in some issue of sin. Man, I love the fact that Jesus Christ knows exactly who we are. He knows, he knows how broken we are at times, how badly we desperately need him. Praise God for that. Luke chapter 5, verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? We're going to do an, uh, a little bit of an, uh, uh, an illustration right here, okay? I'm going to think of something right now. And on the count of three, I want you guys to shout it out. Go ahead. One, two, three. What was that? Oh, nope, that wasn't it. Okay, thank you for trying, okay? Yeah, uh, you can't know what I'm thinking. You, you don't know that I'm thinking about purple polka-dotted elephants. Uh, that would just be crazy that you should know that. But God knows exactly, Jesus knows exactly what they are thinking, what the, para, uh, what the Pharisees are thinking as they're hearing him speak. He knows exactly. And so before they can even say anything, he is asking them questions. Why do you think that way in your hearts? He knew exactly what was going on. Well, what about the goodness of Jesus Christ? I think that we see that in uh, just in great big old heaping piles whenever it comes to Jesus Christ. But I thought we would look uh, specifically at a couple of instances here. Whenever it comes to his goodness, uh, we can see in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, uh, I, there have been all too many times where I imagine we found ourselves in a situation where we see somebody and we go, oh, man, and we duck into the next aisle so as to maybe avoid a conversation. Jesus didn't do that. He looked at the crowds who have been following him, desiring to see him perform some kind of a miracle. Many of them are probably pursuing for all kinds of wrong reasons. They just want to see what's going to happen next. And Jesus looks at them and has compassion on them anyway. We can also see that he spent time with people that maybe even today we would consider untouchable. We can see multiple times where Jesus works with the lepers and he heals them. Matthew chapter 8 verses 2 through 3 says, And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. Right now we got this COVID thing going on and we're all a little bit uh, worried about it. And, you know, I'm trying to encourage you guys to wear masks and, and stay separated from one another because that's the instructions of our health department here in St. Francis County. But if we had somebody walking in here with leprosy and they got bits of their body falling off, stinking and smelling foul and trying to hold everything on with rags, you wouldn't want to be within 20 feet of the person. If they started coming close to you like Al's walking towards the front right now, you'd be walking backwards. Right. Jesus Christ comes right up to him. The, the leper comes to him. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. 
Do you imagine what the disciples were thinking? <gasps> no, no, right? <laughs> we don't get that from the Bible, though. Yeah, he touched him and cleaned him. What about tax collectors? You know, I already joked around about the IRS. We're not a big fan of it. But for us today, that's just all there is. It's this great big thing that exists, and it's not like it's all that personal. It's rather impersonal. But for the tax collector in this day, the tax collector was somebody who was once a part of the group of people. And he was somebody who knew exactly how much Don Vino had in his bank account because he'd seen his house and knew what, knew what it all looked like. And he knew the cars that Al drives. And, and every time he would see Charles, he'd be looking and thinking, that's an awfully nice suit. Add another tally, right? And turning in those lists to the government so he can then say, the, you owe this much, you owe this much, and you owe this much, plus... There's the extra on top, the Daniel fee, the Daniel fee, the Daniel fee. You get to keep everything you took on top. In other words, for them, a tax collector was a traitor. They were the Benedict Arnold. They were the person that you looked at and you hated the very sight of. Jesus Christ looked at Zacchaeus and called him down to him. You know, I'm spending time with you today. We've got Jesus Christ doing this. Luke chapter 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. I want to spend time with you. This last group, I put sinners because I didn't know who all we would have inside the room. I didn't know if we'd have any young people. Luke chapter 7, verses 37 through 39 says, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with her hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. I want you guys to know that is intimate right there. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Jesus welcomed that interaction. Jesus loved this sinful woman. Jesus ultimately would love her so much that he would walk to the cross where he'd be stretched out and crucified for her in part. That's incredible to think about. You know, ultimately, Jesus willingly went to the cross for us. First Peter chapter 2, verses 24 to 25 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus Christ most certainly is a good God. He is everything that is good. What about the eternality of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ, the idea of being an uncreate, uncreated. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. That is speaking of Jesus Christ. John chapter 17, verse 5 says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So Jesus praying to the Father in John 17 says, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before everything else came into being. When it comes to Jesus, we can understand that he is uncreated and that he continues to exist. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? He says, will you come in the same way? He will come in the same way you saw him go. OK, he'll come back. Jesus Christ 
continues to exist. He continues to be our Savior. He continues to be everything that we need. Now, whenever it comes to Jesus Christ, I think there are probably more objections, um, and I'm going to deal with these just shortly, very quickly. The objections to Jesus uh, being uh, God, uh, number one, uh, this idea of him being firstborn, the, the firstborn issue that we see in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. It says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Um, and I'm sure that in you guys' research uh, dealing with Jehovah's Witness and other groups that uh, commit Trinitarian uh, fallacies, heresies. Um, you will have heard this, uh, but this is not speaking of his creation or his birth. Rather, the answer is found just a few verses later in verse 18, where it speaks of his preeminence. Now, um, I understand all about this because I am the oldest of three sons, um, and in my mind, I like to joke around with my mom and dad that I am the most loved one, and they say, yes, that's exactly right, Jesse. Um, which is my youngest brother's name, okay? Uh, but it's speaking of the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is, is greater than everything else in all of creation. So it's not that he was created. Well, what about the objection that um, not, he's not even the, the Son of God, he doesn't know the, the day or the hour, okay? Not even the Son of God knows the day or the hour that, that God is going to end all things. Mark chapter 13, verse 32, uh, Jesus says, But concerning the day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, and I know that there are individuals who look at that and then say, see, he doesn't know everything. But there are some things that Jesus did in his earthly ministry where he set things aside. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8 says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This this emptying is best understood as a voluntary limiting or availing of his divine attributes. It does not mean that he is not God. Lastly, what about the argument where you have people looking and saying, but Jesus glorifies the Father. Surely that means that Jesus is less than uh, God the Father in some way. Uh, we see this. And we see Jesus glorifying the Father in many places, including the high priestly prayer that we've already talked about in John chapter 17 and uh, the Sermon on the Mount as he teaches the people to pray. Uh, but Matthew chapter 17, we see the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, where we get a quick glimpse of the the glory that Jesus has in the presence of the Father, and it is not something to be ignored. Uh, once again, we have the Father uttering, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. It's a pretty incredible thing we see. So here's where I get to this point. We're going to conclude. I believe that it is very easily seen from Scripture that the Father is God and that the Son is God. Now I think it's time for Kevin Luna to come up here, and we're going to see the Holy Spirit is God.